Good evening, everybody. Tonight, uh, we're very pleased to have with us Yasmin Martha of Hands of the People of Iran. And we're looking at Hamas, which is easier said than done, as anybody who's looked up uh, what Hamas exactly is will, will be able to tell you. They're changing quite a lot. They have changed quite a lot and they're continuing to change. So we're looking at the origins. We're looking at political platform, how it's changed, etc. Probably also the relationship with the Muslim Brotherhood. And I would have thought, as has come up in every single session that we've done so far on this issue, should we support it? Yes or no. And that uh, is a problem for many on the left who think they have to say either yes or no. There's probably another answer. So I'll shut up now. Thank you, Yasmin, for joining us. Um, once we're done with the introduction, 30 to 40 minutes, I'll ask you a few questions and then we'll open up uh, to the floor for questions and contributions. Thank you for joining us. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, should I start? Yes, please. Yes, okay. please. Um, first of all, um, let me start by saying that uh, there isn't a simple answer, as Tina implied, uh, to the question posed in terms of uh, what is Hamas, where, what should we do about it? What I try, what I will try and do is go through a number of facts that maybe we didn't know on the 8th or 7th, 8th of October, and um, try and move forward with those facts, but also then look back at the history of Hamas. First of all, it's clear that Hamas was joined by five or 10, depending on who you listen to or what you read, 10 other Palestinian groups on the 7th of October. And now we know, both from declarations inside um, um, various security forces in Israel, a New York Times article, we know that these exercises started towards uh, 2020. We also know from various declarations that Palestinian Islamic Jihad, PIJ, was one of the five groups because they went on to post videos that showed them taking part in the military operations. Um, there are three other groups that have um, issued statements on Telegram. Now, I'm sure some of you are aware but Telegram is very popular in the Middle East. So they've claimed um, that they have participated in these events and they've taken hostages. They are again the PIJ, uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, the Mujahideen Brigade, Al Nasser Salahuddin Brigade. And we know that their claim is not um, uh, false. The reason we know is that as these release of hostages became an event last week, and in the last two weeks probably, um, Hamas declared that they didn't know the location of some of the hostages because they were not holding them. So these claims are not um, just boasts, they are probably true. I think we also know having looked at the websites of some of the secular uh, non-Islamic organiza Palestinian organizations, that they were also involved. The PFLP, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, is now constantly supporting Hamas and is also uh, was also, by all accounts, involved. I cannot say by how many people, how many forces were involved, but they were clearly involved. And it now looks as the PDFLP, the Popular Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine, was also involved. Hamas's various statements have stressed that there is there was unity between these various groups. And at times it tries to portray them as equal partners. While um, there is no doubt that Hamas played a leading role, and 
even in these claims of uh, unity between disparate groups, Hamas does not hide the fact that uh, it was the main force. On one occasion, about 10 days after the event, Hamas tried in what I heard on BBC World Service to distance itself from some of the worst acts that took part, place on the 7th of October. Um, I'm not sure they didn't mention which ones, they didn't say what they were distancing themselves from, but they said that some groups went beyond a great decision. Um, I was asked about this in a live interview, so I had to respond. And I think that we can't take that claim very seriously because, after all, the authority in Gaza is and was Hamas, and therefore, um, whether they like it or not, whether we approve of it, of everything they did, or we don't approve of what, everything they did, there is a level of responsibility. We also know as a fact. I would say, that Iran and Hezbollah were not involved, and now from various statements, including a statement by Ayatollah Khamenei, we know that they were not informed. And in the case of Iran, Iran claims they are very upset that they weren't informed of the operation. Again, I think that's a very silly comment by Iran, if this was going to be a serious operation, if I was Hamas, as much as I disagree with many of Hamas's policies, the last people I would say would be Iran's Islamic Republic, given that there are so many spies in that regime, that it's not Israeli spies, given that it's not a reliable government. And therefore, I think that's a really um, silly comment by Ayatollah Khamenei. However, uh, I think that it shows that why there wasn't immediately in the aftermath of the 7th of October a uh, carpet bombing of Tehran and Beirut as requested by Israel, as supported by APAC, the um, pro-Israeli lobby group in the United States. It's clear that the U.S. had intelligence that proved what later became well known by other people that Iran and, Leb and Hezbollah were in the dark mainly. I'll talk m later about their position because I think they, they're not coming out of all this very well either. Um, so there is a big debate, as you know, was it uh, was uh, the, the bourgeois press, the Western governments, what want us to concentrate on that single day, the 7th of October, and to ignore um, what even moderate politicians like Guterres have said, that this did not happen in a vacuum. So the backdrop isn't just 50, 60 years of Israeli occupation, uh, probably the most prolonged and brutal military occupation of modern times, but it's also, there is another backdrop to this, and that is the uh, daily violence against the uh, Palestinians in the West Bank, the daily violation of basic religious and personal rights in Jerusalem, the attacks on Al-Aqsa. Uh, today, there was another demonstration, as some of you know, by um, hardline Zionists uh, saying Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is a very important place for many Muslims, is a Jewish holy place. Um, I was reading some things that um, Susan uh, Schneider, a researcher who worked quite hard in the archives of St. Anthony's College, Oxford, has found and I think that sums up in some ways where we are with the history of all this. On the uh, 30th of January of 1921, ha Humphrey Bowman, a British colonial official who was at the time 
starting his job as director of education for the government of Palestine. This was Mandate Palestine. Wrote that the situation in Palestine is not very satisfactory. Everything turns on one word, Zionism. Muslims and Christians, and here I have to emphasize that it's not just the Muslims, there are Palestinian Christians who have for a very long time been afraid of Zionism. And he adds, Zionism means rule by the Jews, of the Jews, for the Jews in Palestine. And um, he adds that although in the large majority of nine to one, um, at this stage, they will be left uh, out of government. They will, the, uh, the Palestinians have a majority of nine to one. In the long term, they will be left of government, gradually deprived of their properties and rights. And he says, not long ago, I visited Weizmann, the leading Zionist in England, and I asked him, if Zionism is to succeed, I take it it can only do so in one or two ways. Either absorb all administrations with its own hands, and the Jews definitely run the country, or, let, or else it must be a way of combining this with Arabs and run a joint cooperative government. Which do you think is it to be? And Wiseman, without hesitation, repeated, there can be no doubt that the first way is the only possible road to success. Combination of the Arabs, combination with the Arabs is impossible. We are now in a minority of one to nine. Very soon the proportion will be reversed and the Arabs will be in a minority while the Jews will be a majority. They will be well treated as all minorities should be, but if the Jews run the country, it will be a Jewish government. The Arabs have their places to look to, Damascus, Mesopotamia, Arabia. Palestine is for the Jews. And I think that sums up at a, in a week where the US Congress has told us that uh, has voted that Zionism is the same as anti-Semitism. It shows us where we are with the actual concept of Zionism and the reactions that it has created amongst Palestinians as the people, as the 700,000 who were thrown out of their properties, their land, as Weizmann predicted in 1948. And later, throughout this period, the creation, the reduction of Palestinian territory on a week by week basis, where we are now left with really, really tiny territories in the West Bank and Gaza, which is now facing um, and, um, complete destruction, and as many people have said, and I will agree with that, ethnic claims. Having said all that, um, the question posed in the title is, is Hamas a terrorist organization? Isn't it or isn't it? Is it a national liberation? I think it's a very, it's not an easy and a pure and simple question uh, to answer, this is the question that Israel and its Western allies keep asking us. And I will uh, agree with people like Adi Schlein in Oxford, who has argued in recent articles that Hamas is a political party with a military wing whose attacks on civilians are terrorist acts. I think that summarizes uh, what I think of Hamas. Having said that, we have to also admit that Hamas is a mass social movement. Um, it does not mean that everyone who supports Hamas or considers itself part of this social movement agrees with the actions, with the political um, 
and military actions, especially of the military wing. But it does mean that this is an organization that plays a very prominent part in the um, in every aspect of Palestinian society, especially in Gaza. It is the force, as we have come to realize over the last two months, it is the force that manages the infrastructure of health and social services in Gaza. And in this, I suppose you could say it has in common um, attitudes with people like uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, or Islam, the pre-revolutionary Islamic movement in Iran, or many other such Islamic movements. Um, it is part and parcel of the, as rightly put by Avishlam, the fabric of Palestinian society. Let me open a bracket here and say that it is a, a, a rather pragmatic organization in many aspects in that, uh, contrary to what its enemies are trying to tell us, um, it takes a, what I would call a relaxed attitude towards cultural religious issues. For example, from what I have read in the last few weeks in particular, postings by women in Gaza, it does not impose forced hijab in the ways that, for example, the Taliban do, or Iran's Islamic Republic do, or ISIS did during its rule in Syria and Iraq. It definitely does not impose this on foreign visitors or politicians, but even in terms of the local populations, there are, uh, those of you who are addicts of social media will know that there are many Palestinian young women from Gaza who have posted sarcastic videos, very nice ones, against Iranian uh, royalists who have said, oh, you want to stay under the repression of Islamic Hamas, uh, and we liberated ourselves last year. And they've said, no, uh, we, we were never forced, but also uh, our attitude is completely different. And here, both in, in Gaza, but also I would say in the UK, I don't know about US and other European countries, but definitely in the UK, headscarves can be seen by sections of young women as signs of rebellion against the superficial pro-colonial women's liberation ideas. I know that uh, at least amongst young students in Oxford, there are uh, secular Arab Iranian women who have never worn a headscarf in their lifetime and now wear this as a sign of rebellion against imperialism, against the current world order. So it's a complicated issue. There is no black and white answer on that, contrary to what Hillary Clinton in her recent silly uh, broadcast about women and um, rape during the events of 7th of October is telling us. Having said all that, let me um, uh, look at um, the history of Hamas. I think most people know, and I won't go into details, that Hamas has close relations with the Muslim Brotherhood, which originated in Egypt. It stemmed from that, started from that. And there is no doubt that the Muslim Brotherhood has uh, similar offsprings in most Arab countries. So there was no surprise that so close to Egypt there was one. However, um, for many decades, uh, the main Palestinian groups, the older comrades will remember very well, were led by secular forces, um, and usually as a secular nationalist, such as Fatah, or secular left-wing forces. And here the left-wing forces were led by Christian Palestinians, George Habash, Habatma, um, a number of other political groups are well-known. 
their general direction wasn't, um, if you like, completely pro-Soviet, but they were closer to the Soviet Union. And both Israel and its main ally, the United States, were of the opinions that wouldn't it be great if he could weaken these people with Islamists in the same way that that was in the late 60s, early 70s, the policy in Afghanistan, in um, everywhere else in terms of uh, what people thought of um, how to weaken, that was the policy. Let's weaken the pro-Soviet forces, let's weaken the secular left, even if they're not pro-Soviet. And in this, um, I'm not sure how much the US was involved, but definitely the predecessor to Mossad sought Hamas as a force that shouldn't be as, as attacked as much as the secular, and the, definitely not as much as the left wing. Palestinian groups. And this gave it, it, there is no doubt, it gave it um, momentum. It allowed it to survive. Its 1988 charter, which is after it had gained some support, and of course we were already seeing the demise of some of the left-wing groups, was, um, I, I would say, a charter that could be described as anti-Semitic, but that was changed. It was subsequently changed dramatically. And by 2006, its election victory was on a more moderate position. It definitely didn't have what anyone could describe as anti-Semitic. Um, and we also know, not only do we know, but even Baroness Varsi of the Conservative Party, I noticed, has been commenting on this. We also know that Netanyahu, um, who was never really keen on peace with any Palestinian faction, uh, did want to play off Palestinian groups against each other, but he thought that supporting and bolstering Hamas was to his advantage. In 2019, there is a well-quoted uh, quote of his speech to his to the Likud party, where he says that anyone's, anyone who wants to thwart the establishment of a Palestinian state has to support bolstering Hamas and transferring money to Hamas. Uh, this is part of our strategy to isolate Palestinians in Gaza from the Palestinians in the West Bank. So I don't think it's, um, uh, I'm giving a, a major clue by saying that this was very much uh, part of uh, the politics of uh, the Israeli state. And in some ways, over the last few years, the fact that Gaza had this very strange position where funds were coming via Qatar, but Israel uh, to Hamas, to the Hamas authorities, following the 2006 election victory, which they did not um, try and renew because, as you will see later, I don't think they would have necessarily won another election. But throughout this period, Israel turned a bright, blind eye to funds coming from Qatar and going to um, Gaza and to Hamas. We have reviewed very briefly, and I am conscious of the time, that what I would say, are recent situations. But I think the questions that we have to address, more important, uh, and I will talk a little bit later about Hamas's funding and Hamas's leadership, but the question we should concentrate on, the questions that is essential, is what, what is the current Israeli response? Is it, as the US and its allies say, proportionate? understandable given the self-defense? 
or is it something else? And I would say um, with reasonable conviction um, that this is ethnic cleansing. There have been many campaigns uh, by Israel in Gaza, um, 1996, 2008, if I'm not mistaken, there's been a number, 2014, war and so on. They were all um, attempts at weakening Hamas, but making sure that the, the people of Gaza kept their homes. They stayed in their homes. This time, we are looking at something dramatically different. And this is what makes this war a completely different scenario, not just for Palestine, but I think for the Middle East and for everyone who is looking at the Middle East in terms of the future of global South, Third World, whatever you want to call it. This time, uh, Israel has told the residents of northern Gaza, which is almost half of the population, first to move to the south of the region. Those who were obeying this order, many didn't because they thought, this is silly, where would we go? Uh, and remember, some of these people are people who've already lost home in other parts of the occupied territory. But those who were ordered, who obeyed the order, were subsequently, many of them were subsequently killed while they were traveling or when they got to their des destination. Today, um, we are talking of, I think, about 1.8 million out of a total of 2.2 million uh, Palestinians who have faced internal displacement. Internal displacement means, in the ways of some of those who have spoken, uh, moving from one tent to another, moving their tent four or five times. These refugees um, are facing what I would, what anyone with a right mind would call forced transfer of civilians. Avi Schlein, in a recent article, clearly defines this as a war crime. And I would say there is no other definition. If you force transfer of civilians, you are talking of war crimes. There is also clearly a plan by Israel, whether this will happen or not is a different matter, but there is a plan to permanently move this population from Gaza. Now, there are various options speculated by various forces, pro-Palestinian, pro-Israeli, about where these people can go to. The Israeli Ministry of Intelligence has a proposal, and the Israeli think tank has supported this vision of transferring the entire population of Gaza to Sinai Peninsula in Egypt. The Egyptian government will not accept a single Palestinian. And in a way, that's why we are seeing this closure of uh, Rafa crossing uh, and this limited access even for humanitarian aid. We then have another scenario proposed or discussed apparently by the Americans with various countries, and that is the transfer of large sections of Palestinians to European countries. Now, anyone who's in Britain this week will see how ridiculous that sounds, because even, I don't know, a few thousand or 10,000 or, or the figure I think is being discussed in various European countries is over 200,000. New refugees coming to uh, Britain is impossible to imagine. And I can't imagine France or Germany being more hospitable to that. The question also remains, as Palestinians keep saying, why should we 
leave our homeland? What will be the difference of leaving our homeland this time as opposed to 1948 when they were forced, Nakba happens and they were forced to leave? There is another aspect to um, the Israeli position, the one that is constantly being argued by uh, Western governments, and that is the concept of self-defense. Um, Francesca Albanese, who is um, the special rapporteur on human rights in occupied territories, has reminded us, and it is being picked up by many academics, that under international law, this right of self-defense is only valid if there is an armed attack by one state against another st state. In other words, if the threat comes from outside. However, both the initial attack by Hamas or historic attacks by Hamas are not by a state and they do not come from outside because according to international law, Israel remains the occupying power because after its withdrawal, it continued to control access to Gaza by land, sea, and air, and that's why aid can't get through. So a state has absolutely no right to self-defense against a territory that it occupies. And in this state, in this case, the self-defense clause of UN Charter has absolutely no relevance. Uh, it is the people under occupation who, um, under international law, actually have a right to resist, including the right to armed resistance. So whatever we think of Hamas, and I personally am no fan of Hamas, the Palestinian people, many of whom didn't, wouldn't have voted for Hamas had there been an election in 2023, have the right to resist. The fact that they, including the right to armed resistance, the fact that they are in such a dire situation that they are not resisting, they are being pushed, makes the situation even worse. Um, so, I also want to look at this uh, claims that the people of Gaza bear a responsibility for Hamas. Uh, the, the Israeli argument has significant flaws. Firstly, it is claims that the 2006 vote for Hamas in the Palestinian legislative elections directly led to the group seizing power through force the following year. Secondly, is that there is a suggestion that uh, Palestinians have accepted 17 years of Hamas rule, so there is a passive acceptance, if not approval, of its ideology and its activities. Now, if you know the demography of Gaza, you will know that the majority of the population currently living in Gaza were not of a voting age or even born when Hamas was elected. Uh, the Palestine Center for Policy and Survey re uh, Research did a, a, a poll, and I, I do accept that these polls can be skewed, but in some ways there, there is some truth in that, that 77% of people living in Gaza expressed a desire for new uh, legislative and presidential elections throughout the Palestinian territories, not just in Gaza. And uh, most of the 67% of the same number didn't believe this such a thing would happen soon. Uh, the poll also showed that although Hamas would re re would gain more votes than Fatah, 34% compared to 31%, 43% of the population polled in this uh, believes that neither group were representing their interests. Um, and 
in Gaza, 73% thought that there was corruption in institutions run by Hamas. Um, so here we are looking at a situation where a population is being punished um, when they are under occupation, the occupying state is killing them. The local authority has done some work. I'm, I don't think we can deny the social and health services created by Hamas in Gaza, but it is not popular. It is facing challenges. It is not um, the kind of government that people would uh, want, but they tolerate it. And he and there is a lot of if you speak to Palestinians, they uh, talk a lot obviously about corruption in Fatah, which was the original reason why Hamas, why Hamas won the two thousand and six election, and we all know how corrupt Fatah is. But there is now um, quite a lot of expressions of concern about Hamas's finances. And here we know that uh, this uh, authority gains, has access to huge funds, contrary to what Iranian uh, opposition forces try and push in the agenda. Iran is the least, is one of the uh, 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 countries that contributes least to the finances of Hamas for the last decade. And at times, Iran and Hamas have been actually on opposing sides of wars, such as the Syrian civil war. And so forget about Iran, but Qatar, Kuwait, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Algeria, Sudan, and to a lesser extent, the United Arab Emirates, and last Iran, do send financial contributions. The most important is Qatar. It's... Um, um, it's a major financier of Hamas. And here we also have, um, um, there is um, no doubt that Hamas has gained support during the Erdogan government from uh, um, Turkey. There is financial support uh, from um, uh, countries such as Kuwait, but what is important, and I, I again have to do a health warning because I'm not sure if Russia's Sputnik news agency is accurate, but according to Sputnik, 95% of Hamas's funding comes from donations from rich individuals and charitable institutions in Arab countries. Now, these rich individuals are not your ordinary rich individuals. They are the uh, relations, the connections to the various emirs in the Gulf states in Saudi Arabia. The charities are not charities where they do fundraising from shops or ordinary people. These are charities that are set up by such individuals and therefore you can see that the finances are um, quite um, quite huge. I mean, there are reports, and again, we have to be very concerned about some of these reports because I always distrust U.S. or uh, what I would consider pro-Zionist maybe forces in U.S. But uh, Hamas is not just uh, sitting on these funds to. Uh, um, run the daily operations in Gaza, but there are major financial institutions, including uh, cryptocurrency uh, funds that uh, apparently, according to Wall Street's journal, uh, Hamas has uh, been active in over the last decade or so. Um, I have quite a lot on the individual leaders of Hamas, but I'm not going to talk. I realize I've, I've, uh, I've, I've talked too much. I want to finish by talking about uh, the proposals put forward by the 
wonderful um, Western governments, and they keep going on about it. Um, and uh, to add insult to injury, we now have Iran's Islamic Republic reneging on its position of uh, axis of resistance. Um, so we can, and there is speculation in Tehran that we might expect even Tehran going for this silly illusion of the two-state solution uh, where um, you would have these Bantu stands in the West Bank becoming a Palestinian state led maybe by Fatah or coalition of Fatah and others. And then you would have the Palestinian state. Well, I think for a start, you could say Israel doesn't want this. So it's just madness to talk about this. But um, I think this uh, Fatah led Palestinian authority which actually over the last few weeks has tried not to criticize Hamas because it knows it will lose even more support within West Bank, is, um, is no better politically or has no better record than Hamas. It's just that the West doesn't like to talk about that corrupt system, but Hamas is the one where you can um, swear at more uh, rigorously. So, first of all, there has been no parliamentary elections in the Fatah-led Palestinian Authority since 20, 2006. It's both weak, corrupt, and it is incompetent, and it can't even govern the West Bank. It receives funds not by the Arab countries I mentioned, but by the European Union, and to a lesser extent from the United States. And instead of supporting the Palestinians, it actually, according to many Palestinians who have suffered in the West Bank over the years, maybe not in the last few weeks, but over the years, it has basically worked as a subcontractor for Israeli security in the area. It is completely incapable of uh, um, reducing settler violence. I noticed Belgium is now and the US apparently are saying they will not allow people, settlers who throw violence against Palestinians to enter their countries. It's just too little and very late. Um, so the Palestinian Authority, Fatah, has uh, presided over what can only be called a gradual but very consistent, very steady takeover of West Bank and East Jerusalem. Uh, we are seeing um, the Muslim holy places being uh, daily attacked by religious fanatics, Zionist fanatics. And um, there is um, no way that Fatah can hold any kind of election because it will lose. Um, and for all its faults, um, Hamas will win slightly more than Fatah. I mean, they're both um, quite awful, but yeah, I would say they will win. So that leaves this one state solution completely um, an impossible illusion, as many people have called it. There are problems with the one state solution because you can't foresee a one state solution without the overthrow of capitalism in the region. Um, I am with some reservations in favor of uh, Moshe Mahova's um, Arab revolution. We have to remember that we are facing these scenarios, we are facing this current situation not because of natural borders. We are not seeing a natural uh, conflict between religions. All of this is the creation of a colonial era, a colonial era where the mandates between Britain and France divided the region according to the Sykes-Picot um, agreement. And therefore, all of these borders, especially the borders close to Palestine, between Palestine, Jordan, Lebanon, are artificial borders. 
there is a very uh, interesting video uh, that the PFLP has from George Habash's time, where he says the best support for the Palestinian people in the Arab countries is to overthrow the Arab leaders. And of course, if you want to get a proper solution to the situation, there is no other way but to foresee the overthrow of a number of very close uh, countries where Palestinians are now a very large section of the population and where the overthrow of the Hashemite rulers in Jordan, I would say a major change in Lebanon uh, beyond this um, uh, sectarian divide imposed on the country and in Syria, where the Alevites have benefited from being a minority and overthrow of these governments and the creation of a new form of state will be the only hope we can look for. I know it's a very distant hope, uh, but in some ways, in the madness created by Israel and supported by Western governments, there are those who see more of a hope for such a solution than anything else we have seen in the Middle East for the last 30, 40 years. Thank you very much. And apologies, I probably talked too much. Not at all. Actually, I have some more questions for you. And um, there's a lot of people are putting their hands up already. Thank you very much, Yasmin. That was fascinating. And I think you, you outlined very well the role of especially British imperialism in the mandating of the, of the region. If you look at, I mean, if just looking at the map, you can see it's been drawn by a rule with the ruler. I mean, these are these are lines like this. How the country has been divided up. You get it in Africa as well, of course, everywhere where colonialism's gone um, wild. But the role of the British in in particular is interesting. When we're getting, we're returning to that subject in a, in a future session. Um, I do have a, a question though with a with a with your solution as well that you've been talking about because um, I mean is that in terms of trying to work out the strategy of Hamas insofar as it had a strategy do you think that was part of what they were hoping for because I mean we we know they were they were trying to stop the normalization of Palestinian oppression which was particularly with Saudi Arabia um, you know coming very close to the to the leadership of Israel and doing deals etc and they certainly uh, put a stop to that to put it mildly that was certainly one strategy but do you think to, were they also hoping that um, maybe Hezbollah maybe in Egypt again something the Muslim Brotherhood will rise up again. Um, Moshe Machova has said in a previous meeting they they have seriously miscalculated the response and they they must have been uh, shocked by nobody joining in. But then on the other hand, you said in your opening, you know, Hezbollah and and Iran both didn't know anything about this or say they didn't know anything about this. And you you said that was sounded correct. So how how do you see Hamas's strategy in terms of what they were hoping to achieve? I think Moshe is right. I, it's very hard to put your place in their situation, but I think Moshe Mahove is right that um, they miscalculated. Now, there is, a, a, there is a kind of debate currently going on, and I believe that, for example, both in Sabra and Shatila, which are the two main Palestinian camps in Beirut, and amongst Palestinians in Gaza, there is quite an um, angry reaction to the fact that the axis of resistance, which was supposed to be Hezbollah, Iran, uh, Houthis in Yemen and Syria, did absolutely nothing. I mean, it's not... Okay, there has been uh, today there is news that Hezbollah uh, is under attack by Israel. But for a for quite a long period since we started all this, there was nothing done by uh, Hezbollah. Now Hezbollah was 
uh, my understanding is that there was a personal message from Biden to Khamenei, Iran's president, saying, if Hezbollah does anything, we will take you responsible and we'll attack Tehran. Now, that's probably true. And that's what Netanyahu wanted. I mean, remember, there are a lot of neocons whose main uh, aim since 2001 has been let bomb, carpet bomb uh, uh, Iran. Um, so you can understand uh, that why people didn't want to do this. Yeah, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I certainly don't want to see what's happening in Gaza in every city in the Middle East, in Beirut or Tehran. Having said that, long term, you have to think, what does this do to the concept of the axis of resistance? And this concept is now defeated. So there is an element of maybe Hamas um, expecting more than what they got. Remember, it's not just, however, they have a success, and that success can't be denied. Not only did they stop Saudi-Israeli um, alliance, they actually brought together Saudi Arabia and Iran. I mean, now, um, Raisi is in Riyadh, uh, uh, Ben Salman is likely to visit Tehran. They are the best of friends. What I think the radical left should say is, why is Iran not in a position more radical than General Sisi or Ben Salman regarding what is a historic and terrible event in the region where Palestinians are facing genocide? You mentioned the axis of resistance, and this is um, quite interesting on a number of levels because you, you outlined that um, Hamas has close relationships with with the Muslim Brotherhood, and um, of, of, in the whole region, I mean, the left is almost invisible now, and it is Muslim organizations. It wasn't always like this, and we come back to this with the whole Nasser movement, etc. But some 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 argue that um, Muslim Brotherhood um, and it's very well financed, and it gets gets a lot of money, but it uses its money very well, and it. As you explained, you know it it has health services, social services, it it supports people, it you know runs schools, etc. So it is a social movement, whereas the left often, you know, says, well, after the elections, we can make things better for you. You have the Muslim Brotherhood um, and Hamas was doing things in the here and now and was already doing all those things that you know <laughs> some of the left were always just sort of promising for the future. But in terms of, you know, the, the and there's been a few questions in the chat as well, the relationship between um, groups like Hamas, Muslim Brotherhood and the left is a tricky one, isn't it? I mean, you haven't really touched much on the program and it is it is a, 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 a question that I think we should look at a little bit. Um, for example, trade unions, as I understand it, the Muslim Brotherhood um, allows trade unions, but they have to be Islamic trade unions. And you basically work with the employer so it's almost like a you know like a like a official state-sponsored union so you don't go to work for example that's seen as as anti-islamic you don't you know striking for example so the the unions are um by religion and not by you know working class self self-organization where you have um i mean you in, in Gaza, girls can go to school, etc. That's not as not as bad as in 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 other countries. But there are issues in terms of aren't they, um, homosexuality, obviously, you know, um, atheism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you know the clashes between between something like a Muslim Brotherhood and the left, and some people on the left have come to see the what is more perhaps an anti-Americanism rather than an anti-capitalism of those organizations. And I just wonder if you could if you could talk a bit about that. I mean, are these are these groups, are these movements that you know socialists um should support, you know, because they are against imperialism. They seem to be against imperialism, but are they really, in your opinion? I think right now we have to see that the main attack 
isn't simply on Hamas, but it's on the Palestinian people. And that's why we should we should support the Palestinian people. The fact that some of them support Hamas is neither here nor there. And from what I can gather, people like PFLP, a secular left-wing, I, I have my reservations about PFLP, but historically and their history with the Iranian left, but um, PFLP now supports Hamas. So what, where are we to make that decision? I think what is important in what you are asking is um, long term. And long term, first of all, I think if you are associated with the Qatari Emir, however slightly better he is than the rest of the Emirates in the Gulf, you have to question the, um, the, the long term politics of organizations financially totally dependent on Qatar, Kuwait, anywhere else. But more importantly, I think even better than Hamas, we can see Hezbollah's social health um, infrastructure work in Lebanon. And there's no doubt I visited southern Lebanon and Hezbollah is not just a political force, it's the school, the hospital, the food kitchen, and so on. And yet Hezbollah in the last 80 days, uh, 40 days, uh, eight, no, sorry, 60 days, the two months, eight weeks, has done very little. And why is that? Because at the end of the day, Hezbollah is part of a capitalist Lebanese government. Hezbollah is not contrary to what many Western leftists believe, the Hezbollah of the early 2000s. This is the Hezbollah that privatized large sections of land and property in Beirut and Lebanon, and is now integrated in the capitalist structure of the Lebanese state. Will it endanger that for the sake of the Palestinian people? No, and we can see it hasn't endangered that, despite the slogans of Mr. Nasrallah. He keeps coming to, there were people expecting to three weeks ago when he made that speech that he was going to radically challenge the Israeli attacks and at least threaten. I mean, we didn't expect him to go to war. I'm not in favor of saying you should have, he should have gone to war. But he was a very lukewarm, what I would call really pathetic speech. And that is when people in Sabra and Shatila said, where is the axis of resistance? So it's the integration of these people in um, deep into the capitalist uh, global structures that stops them um, doing much at a time when anyone, even liberals are now getting annoyed by the way Israel is treating the, the Palestinian population. So, no, I think that's, that's exactly what you are saying, and I agree with you, yeah. Thank you, Yasmin. Um, okay, I'll open up the floor now. Please, comrades, put your hand up if you have a question. Remember, there are no stupid questions. Uh, we're all friends here, and, you know, it's, it's important to learn and to ask any kind of questions or make a contribution that you want to find out things. Um, okay, Sami first. Hello. Okay, I, I think I unmuted. Yes, you have. Hi. Okay, great. Hi, hi. Thanks uh, for uh, letting me talk. Um, very interesting. Thank you, Yasmin. Um, I have uh, one important point to raise, which is the question of uh, uh, liberation movements for the past hundred years and more. I think liberation movements have come in all shapes and sizes, from religious to nationalist, to Marxist, to generally socialist liberation movements. And I think we should locate Hamas within that historic perspective. Palestinian and Palestine are an occupied uh, people. And they have brought about all manner of organizations uh, from the left to the right, 
including religious organizations. And Hamas is one of those organizations. Now, I have never supported Hamas ideologically. I've always supported other Palestinian groups and organizations. Um, but uh, I cannot sit here and say that Hamas is not part of the Palestinian people's national liberation movement. I think they are. And currently, and I think Yasemin alluded to that, the entire, by referencing the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, but it goes beyond that, the entire political spectrum from Palestinian Marxists to religious uh, uh, groups uh, are united around Hamas. And one other correction here is that Hamas are not the only fighting group, certainly, in, uh, in, in Gaza. There are several other groups. In fact, they are too numerous to count sometimes. Uh, all the entire political spectrum of Palestinian uh, resistance are represented within Gaza and within the West Bank, including Fatah, by the way, especially uh, in the West Bank. Uh, uh, there's an, a military wing to, uh, to Fatah called Al Asifa. They are very active as well. So that is uh, uh, my first point. Um, the, the other issue is the question of support that uh, uh, Hamas is getting across the uh, resistance organizations. I think Hezbollah is extremely active. I'm surprised he hasn't been, hasn't been following uh, what's happening on the Lebanese-Palestine uh, uh, borders. Hezbollah has been extremely active. They lost about 100 fighters so far, killed by Israeli bombing. The entire front is, uh, is militarily very active. It's not an all-out war, but certainly it's a war situation. If you follow the Israeli uh, sources, you'll see that over a third of the entire armed forces of Israel today are occupied on the uh, Lebanese borders. And that's a massive chunk of Israeli firepower, whether it's uh, uh, aerial, uh, land, or sea, uh, by the way. Uh, and that is directed against Hezbollah and the Lebanese uh, resistance forces. The Iraqi uh, resistance groups are active. They have engaged in over 75 uh, attacks on US military bases, both in Iraq and uh, Syria. Uh, and the U.S. has retaliated and killed some uh, some Iraqis in the in the process. Uh, Yemen is heavily involved. They have taken over Israeli ships. They have threatened to uh, to uh, stop any Israeli ship going through the Bab el Mandeb Straits, a very strategic waterway through the Red Sea to Israel. So, so I think uh, I think the resistance forces did not obviously know. Uh, beforehand that uh, Hamas is going to attack in this major way, but uh, Hamas leaders themselves, unanimously by the way, all of them, and other resistance uh, groups, uh, Palestinian, uh, praise very highly the role of Hezbollah, the role of Iran, by the way, Yemen, Iraqi resistance, and uh, they, they regard themselves as part of the so-called axis of resistance. This is what the Palestinian leaders are saying across the board. So we cannot uh, second guess that. This is what they are saying. And the Hamas leaders went on record saying that nearly their entire armed uh, support comes from Iran and Hezbollah, including logistical support and training uh, by, by Hezbollah and, and Iran. So the picture has to be looked at from there. I'm not... Uh, uh, suggesting that uh, we should change our ideology and so on. But these are facts on the ground that we need to recognize. And one other issue is the question of being anti-imperialist or not. I think uh, anti-imperialism is, is not some uh, limited box whereby you say this person is anti-imperialist or that group is anti-imperialist. I think actions on the ground 
and where your politics land you in any particular historic period, historical period makes you anti-imperialist or not. And certainly Palestinian liberation organizations are historically within that scope, within the scope of being anti-imperialist. If we define imperialism led by US imperialism as uh, uh, as Lenin used to describe it, or or Marxists in, uh, in general. Uh, this is a political force that is uh, uh, being uh, targeted by US imperialism as a dangerous force that should be crushed. And they have been crush, trying to crush it, not so much as to crush Hamas, but to crush the entire uh, resistance of the Palestinian people because Israel, as it happens, is a massive forward base for U.S. imperialism, and that is, uh, and as a massive forward base for U.S. imperialism, U.S. imperialism has committed itself to defending it and to oppose the peoples of the region. I think I'll stop there. Thanks. Uh, Thank you, Sami. Do you want to um, come back to that, Yasmin? Uh, just briefly, well, I, I didn't say that um, Hamas was not a liberation movement. What I said was that it was a political group with a military wing, and that military wing has been involved historically in acts that I personally don't support. You can support, but they have bordered on... Um, uh, what I would consider not acceptable practices. Ilan Pape, I heard, was talking about 7th of October, and I share his view that some of the acts that took place on the 7th of October should not be defended or justified by anyone, um, Muslim, Marxist, anybody. And I'm with him on that. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going into, I didn't go into the debate of classifying uh, uh, Hamas in that way. In terms of Iraq and Syrian resistance, my understanding is that there has been little skirmishes against US forces. On the last count that the Iranian press was mentioning, there was one contractor, a non-military person who was killed as a result of these heroic acts by the Iraqi and Syrian pro-Iran forces, and four injured Americans. So it's not exactly retaliation for 15,000 Palestinians getting killed. It's not what you would call an adequate response. In terms of Hezbollah, today there is an action and there is a threat, uh, respectively, by Netanyahu. But before that, I am quoting people in Sabra and Shatila. I'm quoting people in Gaza who are saying, where are these people? And the expectation isn't just some small action, some rocket from northern uh, uh, Israel uh, attacking northern Israel. There was an expectation of major war, and that didn't happen. So that's what I'm talking about. In terms of Iran, I hope people, uh, the Western press is very good at translating Ayatollah Khamenei's speeches when he's talking against the West. They completely ignore it when he's being completely pro West. So his great uh, Imam Ay Ayatollah Khamenei this week went on Iranian television to say, we do not seek the destruction of the state of Israel. It is a U-turn. It's the biggest U-turn Iran has made since 1979 revolution. I fell off my chair when I heard what he said. So don't tell me Iran is supporting the Palestinian people. Iran, as always, is taking an extremely pragmatic position, defending its own borders. I'm not saying it's not defending. My family live in Tehran. I don't want Tehran to be bombed to smithereens like Gaza. But don't tell me Iran is taking a radical position. Definitely, its supreme leader isn't. In the same way that in 2001, he showed maps, his government and his revolutionary guards showed maps of where 
the US could bomb Al Qaeda in Afghanistan in the same way that he supported the US invasion of Iraq in 2003. The only problem Iran's Islamic Republic in its most pragmatic pro-Western position has is that it's the US that doesn't forgive it for the revolution of 1979 and for hostage taking in 1980s. So don't tell me Iran's Islamic Republic is somehow uh, pro-Palestinian in the way that Hamas or anybody else should have expected in these terrible days for the Palestinian people. Obviously, it's a subject you feel very strongly about, and uh, thank you, Yasmin. Ken. Thank you, Yasmina. Uh, you mentioned in discussing the actions on the 7th of October that the PFLP and the PDFLP were involved or claimed to be involved. How far were those participating genuinely connected with, if you like, the original PFLP and PDFLP? And how much weight do either of those groups currently have? And is there any possibility they might be able to somehow engineer a secular left solution to the issues around Palestine at the moment. Thank you. Should I answer? Sorry, I got um, I, It's hard for me to say. Um, my um, information from PFLP comes from Iranians who fought with PFLP. Right, and PFLP always had a big contingent of Iranian fighters, and they are still in touch with them. My suspicion is that they exaggerate the influence of PFLP, and uh, partly because I don't see any um, any sign of this in daily press, in the actions in Palestine, and so on. And I think some of it is more wishful thinking rather than reality. But you have to think that even amongst Hamas supporters or people in Gaza who might have benefited from Hamas's infrastructure, there is this large section that are disillusioned by Hamas. And therefore, they must be looking at other forces. And by tradition, people go back to what they know and what they would know in Palestine would be groups like that. Given that Fatah is completely discredited, it does leave these two organizations. Now, um, Leila Khalid, who I hope you remember, was one of the hijackers. Uh, she has been very outspoken and she has actually, she was... I believe she was thrown out of France in the first weeks uh, after 7th of October because she was going around campuses speaking to Arab French students. And she was defending um, events in Gaza. She was supporting the Palestinians and so on. And the French government uh, couldn't tolerate such uh, the speech. Not She wasn't armed, obviously. And therefore, she was deported. Um, I do think that the PFLP has support amongst uh, young Arabs in France, I would say, and young Arab, second generation Arab migrant immigrants in Europe. I am not, I'm not in a position to give you anything more. As I said, the comrades I know say, oh, the PFLP is there and so on. There is no doubt that Hamas does not deny the fact that one of the five main groups involved in the events on the 7th, so it had taken, uh, by that I mean they had taken PFLP, I don't know about PDFLP, but they had taken PFLP uh, um, as a force they could confide in. Not many people knew about details, and they were part of the planning. So I assume that is the case. Um, and they do say they have hostages, although there is no confirmation. 
Thank you, Yasmin. A, a question, further question on this as well. I'm just bringing it in quickly in the Q and A. Um, somebody wants to ask you if you consider it a legitimate and or be politically wise for the Palestinian left to enter into alliances with Hamas. If so, what mistakes should be avoided in order to not end up repeating some of the mistakes that the left did in Iran? Very difficult question. Um, I think there are alliances being formed. And when you're facing this kind of you know, bombardment, genocide, I, mean, I would go beyond ethnic cleansing. Avi Schlein debates, I think, with himself whether it's ethnic cleansing or genocide. Marisha Mahover calls it ethnic cleansing. When you're facing such a terrible situation, it's not the same as sitting in a meeting room and deciding what you do. And it's, I think sometimes events forces you to do alliances. Having said that, the mistake um, of the Iranian left, I think, was not just entering into alliances, but accepting the rule of the Islamic groups. And that's a different thing. So if you accept the hegemony of Islamic forces, then you're no longer representing the class and you're no longer an independent force. And it's that that makes you in a worse position. Now, you can be in tactical alliances without making strategic alliances. And I think uh, there is no doubt, tactically, you have to now fight in one front. There is no other way. But strategically, accepting um, well, Hamas has changed, Hamas keeps evolving, but accepting an Islamic state it would be a mistake because you can't strategically move out of it quickly. And that was the, the mistake of the Iranian left. So I'm not a Trotskyist, but I do like the quote by Trotsky is that you can make alliances with the devil, just don't call him an angel and you know always keep politically independent. Thank you for that, uh, Yasmin. Steve, please. Same. trying to unmute myself can yeah. you hear me yep. yeah yeah thank you very much uh yes i mean it's uh very informative um on uh if you asked me on uh october the 6th if i supported hamas i would have said no um after that I would say yes, but uh, critical support. And I think uh, Yasmin said, uh, you know, don't subsume yourself into Hamas or any other body like that. And uh, I think we have to uh, face the reality of uh, this uh, anti-colonial warfare. It can be a very messy, dirty, bloody affair. That's just the way it is. It was, it's like the uh, resistance movement uh, during the Second World War in Europe. Uh, uh, they, they hid among the people, just like the Viet Cong did this. And they used some pretty uh, rough tactics. And, uh, I think that's that's just the way it is, you know. Uh, if and and I think uh, you know we should we should support Hamas, but not uncritically. And uh, I think that's all I have to say. And uh, thank you very much for this. Uh, I was just uh, thinking of Sammy. I think he should have his own program because. <laughs> He did such a, such, such a good job uh, speaking to us. But anyway, thank, thank you. you. Um, quick follow-up question on that, Yasmin, if you don't mind. I mean, the, you did talk briefly about where Hamas came about in 1987, and it was the beginning of the first Intifada, of course, and when they were 
the Palestinians were sold out by Fatah and and the PLO and the Oslo agreements, which is when when Hamas started started to grow and and grow. And um, you know, I mean, you've 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 given some some interesting polls about how they weren't necessarily the majority then. Um, they won the elections, obviously, and recent polls seem to imply that support's gone up massively, as you'd expect. You've been, you know, you've been uh, now under bombardment, and they've pulled off, you know, the 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 biggest military defeat of Israel for for some time. So they will have had some support. I was interested in you, and you briefly touched on that um, on Israel. Um, sort of turning a blind eye to Hamas for some time. And we also know, and that's been in the papers today also, that they've turned a blind eye to um, to the sort of uh, threats being made or preparations being made, et cetera, and didn't take it seriously. And that does, um, you know, does, does back the question, you know, is is Hamas really just the other side of the, the, the coin in, in that sense, you know, that Israel kept it going because, A, you can... Um, terrorize the whole country then if you say that this terrorist organization is is running is running Hamas um but you also you know you leave them to it and you don't take take responsibility are they kind of do you see them as a sort of you know a, a relationship that was feeding off each other Israel and and Hamas uh, there is an element of that but I think the main thing for Israel is its western allies and its Western allies were promoting Fatah. So it made sense to weaken, and this is when Fatah wasn't supported. I mean, I'm not talking of Fatah of the early days, Fatah in, in, after Oslo, during Oslo, just before Oslo, these kind of times. And because, and, and you can still hear it, I mean, cleverly, when he was foreign secretary before he became Rwanda man, he kept saying, oh, there's the two-state solution. You know, the, Biden goes on, Sunak goes on about it, stupid Starmer goes on about the two-state solution. Now, all of this relies on Fatah, doesn't it? So Israel looks at its allies and says, oh, these people are promoting, keep promoting Fatah. EU pays Fatah, actually funds uh, quite a bit of what Fatah does. So it made sense to weaken Fatah. And his speech in 2019 to Likud is very clear. He says, instead of supporting, we, we can promote somebody else and we can turn a blind eye. So yes, they did live on each other. On the other hand, I think there is an element of um, racism among Ashkenazi Zionists in that they think these Palestinians can't do much. So if I understand it correctly, and there are different opinions on this, I'm just speculating. So clearly, lots of people were going to IDF and Netanyahu and saying, look, Hamas is preparing this um, attack, yeah? And they ignored it. And I think some of it is the arrogance of the Israeli state. These Muslims, they can't do this. They will not be able to pull it through. And there is, so it wasn't necessarily turning a blind eye on what Hamas was doing, but this perception that our main enemy is Fatah because it has quite strong backers in Western government, and these Muslims won't be able to do much anymore. You know, it was a combination of both, which allowed Hamas to get stronger as a result of this blind attitude of um, the Israeli state. But I could be wrong. I mean, there are those, as you know, who believes that uh, the Israeli state knew about the attacks and deliberately allowed it to happen. And there were conspiracy theories. I don't believe it, but yeah, that's a possibility. Well, judging by the amount of trouble that Netanyahu is in now, it would have been a suicide mission. He's it looks like he's not going to last much longer. But having, you know, if you, if they'd really waited and watched, uh, that would have been quite outrageous. That is also some some Israeli families seem to, you know, imply that's that's what they or didn't react quick enough for sure. Moshe Machov also says there's a, an aspect of sexism because some of the um, Israeli soldiers who were um, giving warning shots about Hamas's plans uh, were women, <laughs> and they just 
weren't really taken seriously. Um, Agnes, please. Well, you just answered my question in the last two minutes or the last minute, but I'm still going to pause it. Um, because uh, there were all these demonstrations against Netanyahu um, regarding what he was doing to the legal system and judges and all that for weeks and weeks and months and months before before uh, 7th of October. And so after that, there seems to have been some unity in Israel. And, and as far as I know, those demonstrations definitely stopped. So I was going to ask whether you thought that um, Hamas did Netanyahu, Neta, I can never pronounce his name, perhaps I don't want to, but him, a favor because the focus shifted from from all the legal problems and and those sort of demonstrations. But anyway, just before Tina called me, you seem to have answered the question. So I'll leave it to you whether you answer again. <laughs> Thanks, Agnes. Do you want to say something, Yasmin? Yeah, just very quickly. I th I think there's an uh, both are true. I mean, in some ways, the demonstrations haven't gone away. I mean, they pause. But I don't think people have changed their mind. And he does face a serious opposition by families. Even today, yesterday, they were saying all these attacks on South on Khan Yunus and South Gaza is endangering the life of hostages who are in that part. And clearly, the families of the hostages, their protests, which I saw online, were quite significant in forcing Israel for the pauses that it did accept last week, because the families were quite aggressive and so on. The sad part of all this is that many of the areas affected by the 7th of October attack were actually places where opposition to Netanyahu and Likud and the right-wing religious people lived. Um, the kibbutz in those areas were actually, um, there are a lot of peace activists amongst the hostages and the families of hostages. And there is an accusation by, the fam by these people, uh, I've heard it from many Israeli um, anti-Zionists, there is an opposition by these people saying, even as the events were happening, the IDF, the Israeli military forces, were deployed in the West Bank to defend settlers as opposed to defending the people who were under attack. So the kibbutz residents of uh, immediate southern Israel, immediately um, close to the Gaza border, are very unhappy with the way things have developed. And this, these reports by New York Times and others that they dismissed the uh, intelligence report, has made other sections angry as well. So I don't think it's as straightforward as that. I think at the moment we can't tell because there's so much going on. I still see uh, demonstrations by people uh, who are protesting against um, the, the attacks in Gaza, by people who are saying we want the hostages back. So it's a it's an evolving situation. I don't think we should say uh, it solved the problem for Netanyahu. He's gonna face this uh, corruption trial. I thought he was delaying. I mean, we were predicting, and Moshe was rightly saying that uh, um, uh, 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 Netanyahu wants this war to go on and on because he wants to delay the trial. But he's facing the trial now, so maybe I don't know. Interesting. Um, William, please. And I must say, I find the whole program excellent, especially the contributions from Yasmin and Simi. And I think probably I would come down on Simi's side. Uh, I think there's an arrogance of people who are outside of the struggle to start dictating and even making serious criticism what's going on within the struggle. I think our responsibility and the responsibility of anyone outside of uh, the area at the, at the conflict at the moment is to give unconditional support 
to the Palestinian people. Uh, now, I'm tempted to say, this is another mess you British made, but, but I won't say that because it wouldn't be nice. Right? Also, I think that uh, if we were to, if Britain, and if they left in Britain, but they get their act together, they would create a, a solidarity movement that would not only support the Palestinian people and their struggle, because it was the British that created the thing, but anywhere else in the world where you are left with the residue of British imperialism and say, this was done in our name and we're sorry, we, we want it to end. Now, if there isn't sufficient left-wing forces in Britain to do that, it's a shameful act. Hmm. Thanks, William. That's a, it's a, you're touching on a, a good question there. Um, what can we actually do and what role can the left play in, you know, imperialist countries like, like Britain? What, what do you think? I mean, there's demonstrations. Yes, we've, we've all been to Palestine demonstrations. Um, I quite like the, um, you know, not, not moving um, goods meant for Israel by, you know, organized working class resistance. How how what should the left attitude in Britain be now? Can we can we make you know judgment calls etc. What what should our role be, Yasmin? Yeah, I I am fully in favor of unconditional support for the Palestinian people. I think that's the bottom line. You can't and whatever they decide, it doesn't matter. At the moment, our stance has to be unconditional support for the Palestinian people. BDS is good. I think we have to think about it, the boycott, disinvestment. In fact, um, we are going to face the idea of uh, attacks against those, who, those of us who are vocal and supporting the Palestinian people. So, you know, support academics, support journalists, support writers, support artists who are supporting the Palestinians. We are going to face those kind of things. Um, I think we do need to consider uh, demonstrations that are more focused on local areas where especially Labour MPs live. And I, I've heard this from uh, Palestinians that it is important. Uh, it's even more important than the large big demonstrations in London. And so not that those are not important, but, you know, targeting Starmer's seat, targeting Emily Thornberry, targeting people uh, who come and give these stupid statements about uh, the legitimacy of Israeli self-defense, uh, which I think Abi Shalom has destroyed completely. You can't be the occupying power and then um, uh, go on about um, uh, uh, <laughs> self-defense. You don't self-defense when you occupy, you know. This is, just doesn't work like that. And these are the kind of things we have to do. But I think also we must uh, try and think of political agitations locally and nationally and constantly bring up the question of Israel, uh, Palestine. I think campuses are very good. They're, I see more support for Palestinians than I had ever seen in my many years in British uh, universities. And uh, we should build on that. We should build on that. One thing that isn't necessarily um, uh, uh, going to happen is that suddenly the left seems to think that they can build their own parties, their own organization. We have to be realistic that in a lot of these um, protests, we have allies who are not going to be long-term allies of the working class in Britain. But tactically, now we have to, the main, there's one primary issue, defending the Palestinian people. What's also interesting is in, in a period like this, the 
gap between what they tell us, you know, in the papers, in the media, in the BBC, and reality is so wide at the moment. It does, I think, open up um, comrades to think things through and see beyond, for perhaps on other issues as well, similar to the monarchy when they're doing uh, something. It, it, you know, if something happens in in the media, it does it does open up um, the the possibility of looking beyond capitalism as well. Um, Latif, you're in the audience. I think you don't want to come in as a panelist, but you can speak now if you'd like. Latif Parker. You've had your hand up. Perhaps it's a mistake. Latif? No, okay. We've got one more person who's got their hand up, and that's uh, Anthony. Hi. Yes, I, th I think the first thing you got to talk about is why is imperialism escalated this war? I, I, I think a lot, of the, a lot of the ruling classes in the imperialist countries have got a suicide wish, the way they're upsetting a lot of people around the world. Uh, but even, I mean, the dollar's threatened. Uh, Saudi Arabia, um, Egypt are all going to join the Brexit to terrorise the Middle East. Um, but the key thing is, if, uh, even in the rise of capitalism, when it was supplanted feudalism, which struck the Industrial Revolution in the colonies, Marx opposed colonialism because it set back the productive forces there. And I think Sammy is quite correct. I think every, uh, uh, every struggle against imperialism has took different forms. I wouldn't be in favour of a political popular front, but I'd be in favour of uh, working class leadership. I mean, the Social Democrats in the imperialist countries would, would be like uh, in the height of imperialism before the First World War, but they're the fully <laughs> democratic because uh, they're inferior racist reasons. We can't be abstentionists because of the suppression of the unions. But it, there's a mass movement against the Zionists. Organise independent union, bring them on the streets. You can move from democratic in order to challenge imperialism and capitalism in the whole bunch of areas. You can't be abstentionist. You've got to start where the battle is. Uh, and uh, as you can see, this mass role of the Garcia masses against uh, against the Zionist genocide. This is one of the biggest radicalizations since Vietnam. Uh, uh, you got a mass communist movement in the campuses, and even back where workers are saying, you know, the genocide by Israel. And the, uh, and this uh, and this we can build a mass movement. But uh, uh, what you have to understand is the dual nature of the capitalist na nationalists. The, they serve imperialism, they're part of it, but also they have to get their resources and get rid of them. So they have to fight in. <clears throat> so, so we don't agree with individual terrorism. The Israeli working class could come in behind the Palestinians in the democratic uh, uh, secular Palestine. Uh, I think Biden's going to go, I don't think Trump's going to get in. 20% of the youth want communism in America. I'll finish on this. I think Kennedy's one there's an independent. I saw on Wikipedia on the timeline for events. Uh, I think he's going to make some very demagogic speeches since Roosevelt and Kennedy, the first candidate, that they can't end this war. They, to stop communism in the, among the youth and the working class and middle class, they made it a social democratic party. Kennedy, they don't stop this, stop this war. Uh, it's not going to be Kennedy solving. It's going to be social democracy and revolutions are coming in out of this war. And uh, what's happening about Irasco Mob? I mean, that's going to cause a regional war. You could have the regional war that I think I'll finish on this. In 1948, it said on the Encyclopedia Britannica, they lost the war because they were fighting each other. The whole Arab uh, Russia is trying to unite. Uh, the danger now compromises where we've got the possibility of a world revolution 100 years throughout the world because of these people's stupidity. They reflect a dying system. As Trotsky said, the Tsar couldn't save the. Uh, Capitalism, because it was a dying regime. The worst people have had the period they're in. Same happened with the other third feudalism, with Charles the First uh, and uh, Louis the Sixteenth or Seventeenth. But I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you, Anthony. Um, we have one more person with a hand up now. Actually, um, Ian, I bring in. Also, Yasmin, there's a question in the chat at the moment. I know we're it's we're coming up to two hours now. We're we're coming to an end now about um, you know sort of international law and um, should we try to get some of those war criminals uh, arrested by the Hague or, or um, other international bodies? 
which is um a funny one because it's it's them countries running <laughs> international law institution usually <laughs> ian you're um, a panelist now if you want to switch on your camera yeah and then yasmin you could come in to sum up and reply to anything hi hi ian well, first of all, thank you, Jasmine. It is a superb talk. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. <clears throat> I appreciate what I'm about to ask. You, you don't necessarily have a hotline to the Hamas military command, but nevertheless, uh, I can only just make a few observations. Um, firstly, the the, uh, the 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 supposed invincibility of the IDF uh, has been shaken enormously uh, on the seventh of October. Um, after the Yom Kippur War, they, you know, they, 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 their prestige was enormously high. As far as I can see, um, on the 7th of October, a lot of them ran away. And they're dependent really very much on uh, a lot of high-tech um, equipment, which they have uh, in, in abundance. And, and a, you know, a, a US battle fleet sitting off the shore just, to, just in case. Uh, and from what I understand, there is some now... British military involvement as well. So they've got the technology. Um, I've seen very few videos of uh, Hamas fighters in resistance, but I have seen some. What they only seem to have really is AK-47s and rocket prop propelled grenades, grenades, which are quite limited in what they can do. They, they can't really take out tanks, although they can perhaps disable them or whatever. At the same time, Israel is talking in terms of it being a long war. How sustainable do you think Hamas is in terms of maintaining its fighters in the field? And can can they be maintained in the field? Because it seems to me that in a, in a way, um, Israel mobilized 630,000 reservists. And I'm going to guess that a lot of them wouldn't be particularly good at fighting in built up areas and street to street and that kind of thing and, and the people that we're seeing on the ground now are, are kind of the, the elite idf fighters and those other 630 odd thousand are going to be quite vulnerable uh in a long campaign plus of course can israel maintain that number of reservists in the field uh without causing it any great difficulty so i appreciate it's a bit of a rambling question but an evaluation really of the the military balance of forces if, if if you if you know anything about that and also perhaps yasmin if you when you were summing up i mean you know bar a revolution in the in the area you know what is the most likely outcome over the next um year or so would be very interesting thank you difficult question okay first on you see, you have to support anti-colonial struggles, and some of them are not progressive, and they are not led by the working class. But you have to think that after so many decades, when colonialism has become imperialism, what are we looking at in the Middle East? We are looking at reactionary states, one after the other, where the rights, basic rights of the working class is being trampled upon. And you can't just say, oh, well, let's just stay with this anti-colonial myth, because at the end of the day, what else is there? At some stage, you have to say, unless the working class takes an independent strategic position, then these soft anti-colonial people who become capitalist reactionary states, client states of imperialism, client states of neoliberal capitalism, as the wonderful Islamic Republic of Iran that Sami worships so much, have become, then where are we with these states? The Iranian government, one of the reasons, and they admit it, one of the reasons the Iranian government can't do much is that the security forces are mainly involved inside the borders of the country, trying to stop the anti veil uh, protest, the working class protest, the youth protest, they haven't got the forces to go anywhere else. So don't tell me about colonial anti-colonialists who can do something. They are tied up in other reactionary struggles. So 
I think we have to be realistic and question what has happened for after so many Basist nationalist governments, after so many religious anti-colonial movements, why are we facing the genocide of the Palestinian people in the region? And the answer is they are not the answer. That's the fundamental question we can surmise from all this. On ICC, I mean, I wish you could, I mean, come on, there's a war crime. Everyone, every academic I meet, uh, some of them are not even necessarily pro-Palestinian, seem to agree there's a war crime being committed. And, and leaders of Western governments are supporting war crimes, so they are contributing to a war crime. But the, I, the United States and Israel are not in the ICC, so it wouldn't make any difference anyway. But even say we took Sunak there, who is the judge? Who is the fourth? I am actually positively surprised after decades of um, staying in the middle and not saying much, the UN leadership is taking um, a, a, a reasonably strong position. Guterres is. Um, uh, and um, I, I was reminded this week that uh, if you remember in the previous war and the massacre of Palestinians, only 1,000 few hundreds. And look where we are when we think that was only. Uh, Goldstein, which was the rapporteur for union uh, for the United Nations, produced this report. This report, and his report was very clear. It was uh, a war, um, it was an act of genocide by Israel. And what happened? Nothing. He got attacked by the Zionists, by the pro-Zionist press, and nothing happened of it. But at least, as I said, both the a UN human rights person and Guterres himself are taking a better position than I expected anyway, but I have no hope for the ICC. And I think that is the problem that these international institutions have become part and parcel of the existing order. So they are very quick if some African guy leader had killed 4,000 of its own uh, people occupied uh, a region and uh, killed 4,000 or 2,000 of it, but he would be in uh, facing ICC trial, but uh, don't expect Mr. Netanyahu to be in that position. Um, in terms of what Ian said, it is a completely unequal war. I don't think anyone has any doubt. I mean, um, I'm sure some of you have seen on social media these rocket heads that are being delivered from the US to Israel. And rightly, people say these are the presence of Biden to Palestinian children. You know, these rocket heads are going to go in the front of uh, F-17 planes and be shot, be attacking Gaza. On that level, yes. I don't think Hamas has much. I don't think, unlike Russia, who benefits from Iran-built uh, drones in Ukraine, I have not heard of Iranian drones being used by any of the forces. Islamic Jihad had some, but I think they used them the first few weeks, and that's it. We haven't heard of drones, Iranian drones being used in the same way that the wonderful revolutionary Hezbollah that Sami adored so much hasn't done absolutely nothing regarding drone attacks on Israel. So we don't have much of that. But I don't think that it's as simple as that because I think what we are arguing is here a humanitarian disaster. And at the end of the day, when you go for killing large numbers of civilians, you are losing the moral ground, Whatever, whoever you are, even Netanyahu. Apparently, he is worried about the big demonstrations in the West. Good that he is worried about them. But I think the numbers are getting so uh, 
dramatic. It's such an imbalance of forces that even stupid Blinken is now going around saying, okay, don't attack civilian areas. Come on, they've been attacking civilian areas for eight weeks. What do you mean, don't attack civilian areas? Um, I still hope that, um, I don't think there is a military victory for Hamas possible. There is no way, I can't imagine that. IDF has faced a, 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 a reputation damage. And that reputation damage it was uh, occurred on the 7th of October. But I think that militarily, both the Israeli army and the IDF, and the fact that they are constantly being armed by the biggest military power of the West, the United States, does make it impossible to foresee a military victory. But that is why the whole concept of calling for unconditional ceasefire is important because at least uh, we are defending the Palestinian people, ordinary citizens who are getting killed, and that remains a priority. Thank you very much, Yasmin. That was a fascinating talk. Sorry for comrades who can't come in anymore, but it's uh, already almost nine o'clock. I think we've we've covered a wide range of issues. Must be exhausted, Yasmin. Thank you for coming along. Next week, um, we're looking at uh, the bloody history of British imperialism in the region. Really important issue because without understanding that, we don't understand where particularly Hamas or the Muslim Brotherhood comes from. And that will be uh, delivered by uh, with an introduction by Mike McNair. Looking forward to it. But over 120 people in the meeting, which is excellent. Thank you very much, Yasmin. And I hope to see as many again next week. Bye-bye, comrades.